Well, hello and welcome to church today. This is Christ Church with St Barnabas. It's really great to welcome you to our service online today. Uh, my name is Claire and I think you'll realise that I'm somewhere a bit different today. So I have popped out for a nice uh, walk, get a bit of fresh air. It's a gorgeous autumn uh, morning. I've just walked up through some of the woods behind Bramcott. And one of the reasons I've done that, one of the reasons I like coming to this spot uh, is because I love this view. There is something quite special about seeing a horizon uh, and uh, seeing sort of perspective. And I come up to this spot fairly regularly uh, to pray. Uh, sometimes I have specific things that I'm asking God about and seeking his will on. Other times I just come up and listen and be still for a short while. And sometimes I come up with big questions and perhaps some hurt or pain or challenge. And I come up and I, I rant and rage a bit to God. But this feels like a place that I can do that with this perspective, with this view. Um, so I'm grateful for this, this place on our doorstep. I wonder what different ways you talk to God. I wonder how you found that series that we've just finished, the unhurrying together, about being attentive to ourselves and to others and making space and not rushing on to the next thing. Well, our new series starting today is about living with lament. We're going to be looking at the book of Lamentations in the Bible. And that third type of prayer that I mentioned of ranting, raging, talking to God about the pain and the sorrow that we see around. That is all contained within the book of Lamentations. And, you know, I love that the Bible is full of uh, writers that are raw, that are honest, that come with their vulnerability. And God is a great big God that can take that. So, it's probably going to be challenging looking at this book in the Bible, but I pray that it would be a real blessing to us. We are living in a time, I think, of lament, uh, where there is much sorrow and anxiety around us. And I pray that we would be seeking God in that together. So we are going to have a drama shortly, a reading. And Ryan Meller is going to be speaking to us on the first bit of Lamentations. And then there'll be a time to respond. And after this uh, video, there will also be our public prayers. So you are welcome uh, to listen in to those two. So as I start, let me read a few verses. This is from Psalm 145. Let's be still together and hear these words. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are trustworthy, that all your promises are true. Thank you that you provide for our needs, that you satisfy us. And as we come today and we look at your words together, Lord, illuminate it to us, make it alive to us, speak into our hearts and minds today, that we might know you and love you more afresh today than we did yesterday. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Tonight, we find Mr. and Mrs. Lamont at the end of the day, catching the news on TV before going to bed. And that's it from us this morning throughout the evening on the BBC News Channel on BBC One. Time now for the news where you are. Good night. Well, love, that's the end of the news. And it's all such bad news. I doubt I should be able to sleep tonight with worrying. Oh, don't let it worry you, darling. I'm sure the news people are exaggerating just to kind of get a good story, really. They can't do that, can they? Well, I'm sure they do. After all, the news can't be that bad, can it? Well, I don't know. They think that Christmas will be cancelled. That sounds pretty bad to me. And what shall we watch on telly if the usual reruns aren't shown? Mr and Mrs Lamont are very keen on the two Ronnie's Christmas specials. Well, as long as we can watch the two Ronnie's Christmas special, then I'll be happy. <laughs> That's my point. You don't understand, Clev. The world is going down the plug hole right now, as we speak, and there's nothing we can do about it. You're just happy as long as the two Ronnie's reruns are shown at Christmas. You're getting yourself all worried, aren't you? Just before bedtime as well. You won't be able to sleep. Bad things have always happened in the world, haven't they? Can't be any worse than before. Well, previous generations didn't have to deal with the kind of bad things that are happening now. There were two world wars they had to cope with. Yes, yeah, but they won them. Well, they didn't know that at the time, did they? And for a while it looked like Hitler might win. I'm sure they were pretty frightened then. Hmm. This conversation happens every night between Mr. and Mrs. Lamont. Then Mrs. Lamont tries to get Mr. Lamont to focus on something positive to make him feel better. But why don't we think of something positive, you know, to help you sleep tonight? After all, you're fit and healthy, aren't you? Well, for a man of your stage of life, you know, I guess you have got digestive problem. And you've got that problem with your feet. And there is that strange involuntary movement of your finger, but, well, your brain's still sharp. For your age. So, yeah, let's think of the positive, eh? Otherwise, it would be pretty depressing for us all, wouldn't it? So this is the point when Mr Lamont decides the conversation is over and he will head off into the kitchen to make himself a cup of cocoa and put the cat out. But before he does this, he always ends the day with a prayer. God help us, love. Yes, dear. Today's reading is chapter one of the Book of Lamentations. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. How like a widow she is, who was once great amongst the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night Tears are on her cheeks. Among her lovers there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. After affliction and hard labour, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells amongst the nations. She finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed festivals. All her gateways are desolate, her priests groan, her young women grieve, and she is in bitter anguish. Her foes have become her masters, her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile captive before the foe. All the splendour has departed from daughter Zion. Her princes are like the deer that find no pasture. In weakness they have fled before the pursuer. 
In the days of her affliction and wandering Jerusalem remembers all the treasures that were hers in days of old. When her people fell into enemy hands there was no one to help her. Her enemies look at her and laugh at her, de at her destruction. Jerusalem has sinned greatly and so has become unclean. All who honoured her despise her for they have now seen her naked. She herself groans and turns away. Her filthiness clung to her skirts. She did not consider her future. Her fall was astounding. There was no one to comfort her. Look, Lord, on my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy laid hands on all her treasures. She saw pagan nations enter the sanctuary, those you had forbidden to enter the, your assembly. All her people groan as they search for bread. They barter their treasures for food to keep themselves alive. Look, Lord, and consider, for I am despised. It is nothing to you, all who pass by. Look and see. Is any suffering like my suffering that was inflicted on me, that the Lord brought on me on the day of his fierce anger? From on high he sent fire, sent it down on my bones. He spread a net for my feet and turned me back. He made desolate, faint all day long. My sins have been bound into a yoke. By his hands they were woven together. They have been hung around my neck, and the Lord has sapped my strength. He has given me into the hands of those I cannot withstand. The Lord has rejected all the warriors in my midst. He has summoned an army against me to crush my young men. In his winepress the Lord has trampled virgin daughter Judah. This is why I weep, and my eyes overflow with tears. No one is near to comfort me, no one to restore my spirit. My children are destitute, because the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands, but there is no one to comfort her. The Lord has decreed for Jacob that his neighbours become his foes. Jerusalem has become an unclean thing among them. The Lord is righteous, yet I rebelled against his command. Listen, all you people, look on my suffering. My young men and my young women have gone into exile. I called to my allies, but they betrayed me. My priests and my elders perished in the city while they searched for food to keep themselves alive. See, Lord, how distressed I am. I am in torment within, and my heart is disturbed, for I have been most rebellious. Outside the sword bereaves, inside there is only death. People have heard my groaning, but there is no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my distress, they rejoice at what you have done. May you bring that day you have announced, so that they may become like me. Let their wickedness come before you. Deal with them as you have dealt with me, because of all my sins. My groans are many, and my heart is faint. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. How are you feeling? As you look back over this, this past year, as, as you reflect on the world today, as you look to the future, our climate and ecological crises, a, a world out of balance, ravaged by disease, by inequality among people, our exposed injustice of poverty and, and racism, Jobs and livelihoods lost and threatened. Democracy being eroded as we watch war and threats of war. The, the list could go on and on. 
How are you feeling? Anger, frustration, indignation, confusion, sadness, grief, fear, panic, worry, hopelessness, doubt, guilt, shame, horror, fatigue, or just numbness. The Book of Lamentations was written for such times. It's a book of harrowing poetry written in response to the utter devastation when, when Babylon sieged and then destroyed Jerusalem almost 600 years BC and then carried so many away into exile. And the historical events are described fairly briefly in, in a matter of fact way in the second book of Kings verses 24 to 25. But here in Lamentations we have raw bleeding hurting human flesh put on those bones. When we see suffering and death brutally and indiscriminately meted out, followed by an empty, lonely city. Starvation to the point of, of people being driven to eat their own children. And with all that they had thought was secure and, and guaranteed in their status as God's chosen people was lost. And here in chapter one, we hear of Jerusalem, a city personified as a woman in anguish, pain, alone in vulnerable nakedness and humiliation, knowing that this has been a result of sinfulness, something that the Lord has done, yet still crying out in faith to him, look, Lord, on my affliction, look, Lord, and consider. But all through this book, God is striking in his silence. He never utters a word. So on top of this physical and emotional pain is, is a profound existential fear of the future and grief that a way of life that had previously felt so secure had been ripped apart and may never return. This is way, way beyond what I expect and hope most of us have or will ever experience. And it makes uncomfortable, disturbing reading, raising questions that, that we find hard to ask and even harder to answer if we can at all. But Lamentations is here. It's not going away. God caused it to be written and allowed its inclusion in the Bible, in our scripture, his revelation of himself in Jesus Christ. So what does that say? At times like this, it can tell us many things. Not least that, that all these emotions, the things we feel, are at their root God-given. That there is a time and a place for all those things. And that when they come, we are to be attentive to them. Not to try and move on or quickly sweep them away as fast as possible and find something more positive. Lamentations tells us that it's, it's not just okay to not be okay but that there are times when it's appropriate, even good and holy and right not to be okay. There are times when we're supposed to be in a mess, unsettled, angry and upset. Lamentations tells us it's okay not to have all the answers, to be bewildered. You know, I reckon Jesus' first disciples' default state was bewilderment, so we're in good company there. And when we allow ourselves to say, I just don't know, then, then that puts us in a place of humility, doesn't it? Where, where all we can do is point people to Jesus rather than to our own understanding. I don't have all the answers, but, but my confidence, my, my anchor, my rock is, is in a God who, who I do not, cannot fully comprehend, but who has made himself known to me through Jesus Christ. I can see his love and his care for me through Jesus' death and the certainty of life through Jesus' resurrection. As we'll see in the coming weeks, this is where Lamentations itself points us for answers and for hope. But today, um, I want to suggest as we start looking at Lamentations that, that to lament is not a dead end and it's, and it's much more than just some sort of refuge or, or spiritual therapy, but, but something which can take us to other places, places we might otherwise miss. And uh, I just wanna look at three of those places today, each beginning with, with the letter R, um, revelation, resistance, 
and restoration. First of all, re revelation, uh, or at least an important reminder, um, digging into the pain and, and grief of lamentations, we're, we're opening a can of worms about many things we don't fully understand about God and our world, but, but in lament we're asking those questions that we may otherwise never have asked. And in some cases, but, but not all, they can lead us to answers or, or revelation about our God that we wouldn't otherwise hear or at least important reminders that we could otherwise miss. Now I'm glad that, that this sermon is called Opening the Can of Worms, not, not Understanding the Worms or, or Mastering the Worms. I don't have all the answers. And I'm sure that what we'll look at today will, will, will leave us a bit frustrated and, and dissatisfied. But as we'll see, this is part of the point of Lamentations. To be in lament is not about getting all the neat answers in 20 minutes or so and, and quickly moving on. But I hope to share a few helpful pointers which perhaps we can pick up in discussion in this evening's Zoom meeting, um, our sermons in subsequent weeks, um, and in your own personal study or, or in your small groups. So, so worm number one. Um, this worm is the question of sin and the extent to which we can pin our or, or others suffering on, on sin and, and punishment from God. You see, chapter one in Lamentations clearly describes specific sins of Israel as the cause of their suffering through their enemy Babylon. God has brought judgment and punishment upon them. The Lord has decreed, the poet says, the Lord has trampled. What are we to make of this as, as we reflect on our own experience and, and others suffering too? There are many who will want to align the current world situation, including COVID-19, with, with God's punishment for specific sins. But one thing we know is that Lamentations and, and the record in, in the second book of Kings connects particular events in Jerusalem to the equally particular sin and rebellion against God, a breaking of a particular covenant which God had warned, even pleaded with them for years and years. But under Jesus, we are under a new covenant, a covenant of grace where such direct and comprehensive punishment of sin in this life is withheld by God because of Jesus' atoning death for us on the cross and his resurrection to life. And I commend reading Hebrews chapter 10, particularly verses 1 to 18, to you, where it says, Jesus offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, as well as Hebrews 12. Both of those are good places to go. Um, Lamentations just doesn't give us a framework of suffering and sin that we can apply in general to any and all situations of suffering. However, however, Though our situation today, what we're going through, may not be a punishment for specific personal or, or even corporate or national sin, it, it does appear to be a consequence of, of all our sin, of humanity's failure to follow God's call to love him and to love our neighbour, to love and care for the world God made and everything in it. And it's also more than just a natural consequence of brokenness, of, of mismanagement, of something that isn't working quite right. Just read Romans chapter 8 verse 18 onwards which describes an entire creation broken and groaning and it says this is God's intentional response to sin and breaking of covenant with him. This is more than just nature running its course, this is, this is God's sovereign and somehow actually in control of this which which brings us face to face with another worm, um, if worms have faces. Uh, this one is the sovereignty of God. The, the world, it, it, it feels chaotic, doesn't it? It doesn't look like anyone is in control, directing things, let alone an all-powerful, loving God. Theologian and, and bishop Tom Wright encourages us to again turn to Jesus. He says, if you want to know what it means to talk about God being in charge of the world or being sovereign, 
then Jesus himself instructs you to rethink the notion of kingdom, control and, and sovereignty, to rethink that around his death on the cross. This is a striking redefinition of power and, and points in the direction of God running the world through an obedient and ultimately suffering human being. With that obedience and especially that suffering somehow instrumental in the whole process. In Jesus' description of God's kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, the meek, the mourners, the peacemakers, the hungry for justice people. But we often assume Jesus is, is saying, look, try hard to be like this. And if you can manage it, you'll get into my kingdom. But that's not the point, right, goes on. The point is God's kingdom is being launched on earth as in heaven. And the way that it will happen is by God working through people of this sort. Often when, when people, when, when we look out on the world and, and all its disasters, we wonder why why God just doesn't march in and take over? Why does he permit it? Why doesn't he send a thunderbolt and just put things right? And the answer is that God does send thunderbolts. He sent Jesus and now he sends human ones, the poor in spirit, the meek, the mourners, the peacemakers, the hungry for justice people. They, we, are the way God chooses and wants to rule in this world. We are the expression of God's servant sovereignty. And if I can just start to get my head around some, some ways of looking at sin and, and God's sovereignty amongst it all, <clears throat> how, how do I deal with what feels like absence and a cold silence through the whole book of Lamentations? Well, looking elsewhere through the Bible, through scripture, we, we see that perhaps that's not what's going on here. In Jeremiah 42 verse 10, God himself refers to these very same events and says, I am sorry that I had to punish you. And the Hebrew text suggests God's grief, his, his compassion, the God who cares, who sees, who hears. So in Lamentations, this seems not to be a God who turns his back or is busy somewhere else, but, but a God who allows our voices to speak till they have said all they want to or can say. He does not interrupt, whether to comfort or correct, to explain or excuse. He does not even speak his own words over ours. Coming back to, to Romans 8 again and in verse 26, the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans wordless groans. Could it be that God himself in his grief is lost for words, can only groan? Could God the creator facing his world, his people in meltdown, just be in tears alongside us? The story of Jesus in John chapter 11, groaning and just weeping with Lazarus, his family at his tomb, would suggest this is possible, at least. God doesn't speak over our words. He weeps with us. And that's a lesson for us, isn't it? To, to give time and space to our own lament without rushing to find answers, but, but especially to take time to, to look to listen to the lament of others and to prioritise feeling it rather than fixing or resolving it. To withhold that, that desire to explain or, or even trying to find and speak God's words into pain, however hopeful and helpful we may think we're being. Just to be present, to look and to listen and suffer with others. For this is what Jesus does. Sin, sovereignty and, and silence, we, we need lament and the questions that arise within it to bring us to new or renewed encounter, revelation of God. 
But it doesn't stop there. As we understand God a little more in lament, as we connect with his heart and his pain, so we are then also drawn into his mission and his work and onto our second, our resistance. See, our, our secular culture, much of our society tells us that that, that sadness and, and pain is, is, is weakness, maybe a, a kind of failure, failure of well-being. Even the word lament in lamentable is a negative term, connoting something not just bad, but, but unworthy. And perhaps as church, we've, we've taken a bit too much of this in. Faced with, with grief, with, with sadness, with lament, Rather than give time and attention to that, we're tempted to move away from it quickly, rapidly seeking to give um, an explanation or to take the positives out of the situation um, to focus on the teachable moment when what God is saying or, or teaching us, even how this might actually be a joy or a victory in disguise because God works all things for good, right? Or flick through our minds or our Bibles to look for an encouraging verse from Scripture or a word from God in prayer. But in doing so, we risk putting words in God's mouth that just aren't there. And our worship is so often focused on victory, triumph and future hope, all of which are good and true. But Lamentations encourages us to resist hurrying to that. To stop to acknowledge the grief and the pain here and now, to stand alongside and lament with others in theirs. Because, because as we do, as we do, our lament points to a reality now, points there is a problem here and now, that not all is well with the world, that whatever we think the future holds, however bright that is, what is happening here and now matters to God, that there is sinfulness and evil here and now that needs to be resisted and that humanity can't solve it alone. It needs to be brought before God. Lament is, is resistance to evil, to things that aren't right, a refusal to accept things the way they are. And in pointing out our hopelessness without God, lament is also resistance to, to a blind optimism in the world. The spirit of our age, which says things are getting better, things will get better, or, or we can just fix this without God. From revelation to resistance, this leads us on to restoration, to, to justice and to healing. Ugandan theologian Emmanuel Katangole says, Lament is not a call to sentimentality but in standing with those who suffer, it becomes a call to solidarity and to action. And I think he's right. When, when hearts are moved with compassion, which literally means to suffer together, God often moves in power. Just look at Jesus' miracles in the Gospels to see that. Lament as an act of compassion, of suffering with others, in this way is an act of love and war all at once. In our sadness, in our complaint, in our angry questioning, we, we cultivate an attitude that refuses to simply accept things the way they are and then to bring those things before power, before the throne of God and before authorities here on earth and demand a response, justice, healing, restoration. Without lament, Without giving space to our anger, our sadness, our grief, our questions, we, the, the church, risks neglecting our mission, God's mission. Walter Brueggemann says, The community of faith which negates lament soon concludes that the hard issues of justice are improper questions to pose at the throne because the throne seems to be only a place of praise. If justice questions are improper questions at the throne, they soon appear to be improper questions in public places, in schools, in hospitals, in the government, in our courts. And justice questions disappear into civility and docility.
Lamentations tells us that it's, it's more than okay not to be okay with the world. It is God-like. It is Christ-like. Giving compassionate attentiveness to our own and others' sadness, loss, anger, grief. Opening a can of worms and confessing our confusion and uncertainty is to be in a godly place which leads us to encounter with God himself, revelation, reminders of who he is, and from there to resistance and restoration, an act of love and war as we stand alongside those who are hurting, pointing out to authority that something is wrong, demanding something be done, and that without God, we are hopeless. Without lament, I think we become less, less than what? God wants us to be and what the world needs us to be. I hope I've left you more interested in lament, but but also a little frustrated, annoyed, dissatisfied and hungry for more. So why don't you come along this evening on our Zoom call and and make sure you join us over the coming weeks as we dig deeper. But but also go go to that scripture yourself. Look at look at those areas that that I've suggested today um, and others that that you may know. Dig deeper. Let's pray. Lord God, as we look back uh, over this past year, over our lives now, and as we look forward to the future, we spend a moment in, in quiet or, or out loud just just putting voice to how we feel. Just giving it to you. Our sadness, our, our anger, our confusion, whatever it is, we give it to you now. And Father, would you help us to look and to listen and to keep listening to the pain, the, the, the suffering, the trouble that is around us every day, big or, or small, near and far. Would you help us to resist rushing to answers or solutions or to busyness. Help us just to be present and to suffer alongside in, in compassion because that's you, that's, that's who you are. And from our compassion, Lord, we, we pray that, that we would then, then act to to resist the evil in in this world, to point out what's wrong, to to lay that before you, before authorities in, in this world, and not to be satisfied with the way things are. We give all this to you, Lord, and we trust. Because of Jesus, we trust in you, even if we don't fully understand. Keep our eyes fixed. On him, our hope and our rock. Amen.
like you do God, I look to you You're where my help comes from Give me wisdom You know just what to do God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed Give me vision, to see things like you do God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from Give me wisdom, you know just what to do Oh
cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone oh praise the As our service comes to an end, let's pause for a final prayer and blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.